Hey, James, there. Uh, let's see. Hey. Hold on. Can you hear me okay? No, because I... Oh, you know what? I think I don't have my speakers on. Hold on. Speakers... Okay, now I should be able to hear you. There you go. Okay, now I hear you. Yeah, I just posted the links on uh, on uh, on people's account. So okay. They, yeah. Okay. Let's see. There we go. And um, we're already streaming up onto YouTube. Now we'll just wait for uh, Jim to get on there. Let me just get into the live chat. And for those of you who are catching this on the replay, FYI, at the in the description part right here, if you click on the, I think this is the right way to click on it. If you click on that little just arrow right there, that'll drop down the description and there'll be a timestamp that will take you to the start of the video where we're starting the whole um, presentation. That way, uh, because we're about 15 minutes early, so that way you can skip over this 15 minute setup time. All right. And our live chat is set up. I'm not going to scare it or jinx it. <laughs> when, when is the uh, last Tuesday's um, YouTube going to be ready? Well, I started going through it the other night i've just been sick for the last 30 hours um so looking at the screen was just not helping because i had migraines but um i should have it up i mean look the video looks fine i mean it, it's um it looks more a little more pixelated than it was when when i did my test here but uh according to my daughter it's always going to because i'm recording off of zoom mm -hmm. that's going to depend on what network i'm on um yeah. but i use I, the I, cable one here too yeah, I, re I, re I really think we need to uh, move away from Zoom for that particular yeah. reason. Yeah, there's a the only thing with it, I've I've taken a couple of little live because there's some that I watch and they look so gorgeous and they teach how to do all of this. There's just so much in production that you've got to do with sh shooting something like it's going to look gorgeous live. I mean, these look like TV shows being broadcast, but they're live stream. Well, um, Zoom compresses the video. Yeah, yeah. Um, These, they're so, using live stream software um, to do or multi-stream software. Yeah, but if, yeah. if if you're if I I believe if we are presenting via Zoom, we don't have a choice in the matter because Zoom, yeah. uh, okay. whatever signal we transmit to them, they're going to compress it. Yeah. So, um, and then and that also depends on what this uh, your what you're uploading at like so if you're if you're uh if your wi-fi is not ideal because every everything that i've watched has said you have to go ahead and uh plug directly into whatever uh internet you're using yeah but our upload speeds are 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 sufficient for for that yeah so um yeah so uh it's That's yeah it's not a it's a band with it. They are compressing it. Um, oh yeah, they're compressing it. Um, and but so we need to that, start with no matter even when we get rid of Zoom, if we use a multi-stream. Um, from what these things have told me, it's like even if I get the multi-stream by the software, if I'm not putting in the hardware connection, it seems together correctly. I'm still not going to have a nice video Jim, like there. Um, Jim has a thing now. I've I've seen it on Facebook Live and it looks great. Um, uh, uh, but and I know it can be used on YouTube. But he has one of those cameras that um, capture. I guess it, it it can go from frame to frame. It's one camera, but it looks like you got multiple cameras. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, maybe we should look at that and stream that on YouTube. Okay. So uh, that way you can have like a, uh, it, it picks up whoever's doing the speaking and, and they automatically become the, um, you know, whoever, if you're in the well, room. Well, we have that right now at Zoom, it's called speaker view. 
Yeah, but it, it, it does, the, the camera does it. So, yeah. uh, and the video is is really good quality. But uh, anyway, we, we can talk. Yeah, about I have that. to look at that. So we're yeah. just waiting for Jim now. Yeah, video stream. Now, I hear we're getting fancy Jim today. Um, yes, yes, he's that's going what to I be... heard too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need to thank uh, uh, Jim Landers for doing these uh photo tips monthly uh, for us. And I'm going to go ahead, I guess, you know, we got about 10 minutes till we start. So hopefully he, he jumps on. Um, let me get lower. No, we got a couple people who are already in the waiting room. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube that are being patient, not jumping ahead through the, the jumpstart timestamp. Um, Jim is, Jim does these, you know, on his own free time among other projects and, uh, and photo shoots and stuff that he has to do. So we're always really thankful that, you know, he makes some time to do this for us. Um, next month, uh, we will have low light photography um, on Photo Tips Monthly. So, but today's topic um, is gonna be understanding copyright. I actually have questions on him for him too. So um, this is gonna be really great. This is perfect for anybody who's a, not only a photographer, but artist, you know, because um, copyright is, kind of something that we all have to go. And then I see Jim has joined us. Let me get him in. Hi, Jim, how you doing? You still connecting there? I don't know, he don't look so fancy to me. I know, right? I think that's just regular Jim. That looks like in the yeah, picture. Yeah, that's regular. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was thinking we were getting the bow That's tie funny. and the black oh, wait jacket. Wait a minute, where's the bow tie? Yeah, <laughs> I can go put it on. Yeah, I think I think you should. Uh, <laughs> we we told people they're getting we, the fancy. Been, I have, I have time as, as we're, <laughs> we're having the fancy Jim Landers today. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Now it's not so fancy. Look, look at look at these cool studs. All right. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, I, we'll, I bought them from uh, an, an artist who, who does this kind of artwork, but he also has a, a tux shop. Oh, wow. Uh, he was telling me about his art, and I said, show me. And he took me over to it, and I, I said, uh, not all of it was his. And I said, well, which, which ones are yours? And he, he said, these and these and these. And I said, I want those right there. He said, they cost <laughs> a little bit more. And I said, but they're your original artwork, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, that's the ones I want. That's nice. I see diversity of art there. <laughs> yeah, speaking right. of diversifying art, uh, we're in the process of uh, installing a flatbed, wide format flatbed printer, UV printer. So I don't know if you, you're familiar with those, but they so. are just, I mean, they're, they're printing at a whole new level. Uh, two D and a half, right? What two and a half D printing? Yeah, textured printing. <laughs> uh -huh. but, so we can take a photograph and print the actual texture. What? Yeah, I could That's take your awesome. sign and, and print your sign with raised letters. Whoa, cool! Yeah, yeah. So really neat. Um, <laughs> and and we can it's it's a flatbed, so we can print on any rigid stuff like boards or whatever ah. yeah so we got about five minutes i'm going to go ahead and open up oh. the um look at ooh. these cool couplings that is... and i'm going to give those are so cool yeah where'd you get those little camera robin got got them for me as a gift uh, a few years ago yeah. so i've had the camera quite a long time but it's only the stud so i guess it's sure to me too but so what are you photographing tonight uh the uh Southwest School of Arts and Crafts annual one? gala. Oh, what is what does that entail? What 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 do they do at the gala? What is it just? It's a, like a dance, or is it a? Well, it's it's in that same more of a social area. Yeah, it's more social. There, there'll be uh, a sit down dinner. Uh, it starts off with an art show in in Coach Chapel. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it'll, it'll just be a, a mostly social. There'll be events, there'll be some awards and, uh, you know, hobnobbing with, with folks who can afford to donate millions of dollars towards their cause. So people be hobnobbing with you? Is that it? I, I guess so. <laughs> they, they, they did make me feel good when they, when they hired me. Yeah. <laughs> they, 
Yeah, they they said that uh, we had to reduce the uh, the number of photographers this year because I usually have um, three, uh, and uh, and so that meant that it was me. And uh, they said, but you were the most expensive one on the list. <laughs> and I said, well, then why is it me? And they said, because you know all these people, <laughs> and the other photographers <laughs> don't. <laughs> well that's uh, good sometimes it's except not except i don't know. know all those people <laughs> you know, right? I, know, I do know a lot of them but yeah. but no i i i think they uh i don't know i think they might hold me in higher regard than, than maybe they should i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't undersell the great jim landers <laughs> the incredible jim landers now, if they had hired the regular Jim Landers, then I, I, I would agree with that. But yeah. well, that's true. Yeah, that's... <laughs> we got about three more minutes, guys. We're letting people. I've turned off the um, the waiting room, so we're just having people join. And thank you, everybody's coming in with the, their sound muted. Um, if you have a question for Jim during the thing, just go ahead use the chat, um, and we'll have that sit there. And for those of you, again, if you're um, watching on the replay click the description down there on YouTube and there is a timestamp that you can click on that'll jump you right to the start of um, our presentation. Uh, Jim is gonna be covering today, understanding copyright, which is something artists and photographers alike uh, run into. So uh, this is gonna be, I know I have questions too, and um, this will be pretty great. And uh, I think uh, next month we'll have some uh, low light photography and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Uh, what he's going to have uh, planned for us. And uh, we have fancy Jim today because uh, Jim's got to run off to a uh, shoot right after this. So uh, thank you, Jim, again, for your time. We really appreciate it. He's kind of kidding in this because you have a full schedule all the time. Um, so I'll get ready to go ahead and make you host. And you can go ahead yeah. and that way if you want to share your screen and also, you can just go ahead and change uh, either to speaker view um, when you get that. Speaker view. All right. Go and make you host, and you are now host there. Cool. Okay. I'm going to hit record too. Mm -hmm. And uh, go ahead and we'll let you kind of just uh, probably start right into that in about a minute. Just uh, uh, James, did you want to give us a quick intro to Jim? A man that needs no introduction uh, <laughs> that everyone knows, every, everyone's heard it. Um, well, uh, just in case you've been living under a rock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Jim is uh, Finer Works uh, official photography instructor. Uh, so, uh, which means that we look to him as uh, as our go-to guy when it comes to all things uh, related to uh, photography instruction. Um, uh, Jim Landers is the founder of Landers Photography School, and uh, we have. <laughs> We have uh, uh, jointly put together uh, something we call First Thursday, which is a uh, where we um, where well well Jim uh, basically provides a a whole instructional course uh, in an hour and a half. Uh, 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 Jim uh, Landers Photography School teaches not just uh, hour and a half long courses; they, they, he teaches semester long courses. But uh, this is, uh, uh, he has all these incredible classes that are, you know, that last maybe about an hour and a half, an uh, hour to an hour and a half. And uh, we uh, put, we produce these with Landers Photography School for, for free um, um, to anyone that wants to watch them. They can view them on YouTube uh, and Zoom live, or they can watch them later on. And uh, so we're really privileged and really honored to be able to have Jim uh, do these for us. And so, how's that for an introduction? Woohoo! Yeah. Take it away, <laughs> All right. Jim. So, so we'll go ahead and turn it over to Jim now. You guys always make me feel so good. That's 
that, that's that's the way to do it. Anytime someone's gonna to you know share something, you say something nice about them, and it makes makes them uh, you know really ready to go. But uh, yeah, you guys uh, who are who are watching have have um, you know something really special in uh, uh, James and Melissa. They really care about uplifting every one of you. And uh, they do it through multiple different ways. And, you know, the, the business that they have, of course, is one way, but they have lots of different free ways as well. Uh, the first Tuesdays and the first Thursdays. So these things are wonderful. So uh, I need to push a little bit of that, that awesomeness that you push towards me. I need to push it right back at you because you guys freaking rock. <laughs> oh, man, you guys are here for a, a subject that might be a little on the not so exciting side, copyright, but it is something we really should be aware of uh, because there's, uh, most of us will cross paths with something that we're unsure of or something that's totally we're sure isn't the right thing. Like a lot of us photographers have experienced someone else using our work without our permission, where it just pops up somewhere and boom, there it is. In fact, I'll give you an example. Uh, this has been, oh, it's probably been 20 years ago, maybe more than that, uh, where there was a, a bank that I photographed for a magazine. Now I was photographing for the magazine, but the magazine asked me to photograph the bank uh, and they were using it for an article on the bank. And so that's what I created it for. And other than photographing the board, I never actually visited with the board. We didn't talk about what they wanted. We, it was, this was all what the magazine wanted. And uh, probably about a month later, I saw my work being used by the bank on their advertising. Um, this is, some of you may think, well, that's great. They must've really liked your work. Yeah, there's, that's one way to look at it. Sure, sure. Um, but that's also breaking of copyright law. This is what I sell. If I sell it and someone else uses it without purchasing it from me or getting my permission to use it, that puts it in the category of stealing. So that's totally illegal. So let's talk about that just a little bit. I I felt what I had was a, a great public school education. I had teachers who loved us, who cared about us, who were, who were dedicated, hardworking, just wonderful people. And they did a good job of talking about one sliver, one important part, but one sliver of copyright law. And that was, you probably already know, that was plagiarism. They did a good job of talking about plagiarism. Now, that was using someone else's words without their permission or using them as your own. Now, that doesn't mean you can't change it and make it totally different and make it your own. You can use something else as, as your, uh, uh, your motivation, your, your inspiration, but it has to be your own words, not copied or, or not even mostly copied from someone else's words. That's when you use theirs as a source to what it is that you're writing. But they did a good job of, of teaching that part of it, the plagiarism side of things. Um, where you're not supposed to use someone else's work. But I didn't know at the time that this included everything that someone has the ability to create. The English teachers just pulled out the parts that were important because they've got a lot of, a lot of other things to do. So of course they're going to pull out the parts that are important and just share those parts with you. Maybe in your public school education, they told you that everything else was included. Any creation, anything you create is under copyright law. But in mine, they only talked about words. So I wasn't aware of the other things. And I would assume many of you aren't aware of the other things, or maybe we're not. You probably are now. They did a good job of doing that part. They pulled out what they needed to because of time. Well, guess what you guys get? The same thing, but for creatives. This is mostly geared towards photographers and photographic works, but this applies to any creation. Even if you were uh, waiting for your food at, at a restaurant and you were drawing on your napkin, when you create that, you own the copyright to it. Now, if you're smart, you do a little bit more than just that, but on the surface, as far as the law is written, you own it the moment you've created it. It's yours. No one else can use it. For, cop for photographs, you can't copy someone else's original work. Yes, you can see it online. Yes, for the most part, it's really easy to download someone's photographs, but you can't use them, not without their permission. 
There are certain ex exceptions. Uh, there's Creative Commons license, there's educational, but these are, and we'll talk about some of those today. Uh, but uh, for the most part, you don't use someone else's work without their permission with a period at the end of that statement. And I'm probably preaching to the choir with this group. Uh, during this class, we're gonna learn about copyright, what it means, why it exists, how it affects us as photographers, and well, a whole lot more. It, it's not hard to learn, and that's a good thing because every one of us needs to be aware. Now, before I get into the, the legal side of things, I'm going to give a quick disclaimer, just to make sure you know that uh, what I am not, and that is I am not a lawyer. I have no ability to give legal advice. You should not consider this class or me as a substitute for legal advice. This class is simply general information on legal issues that we encounter as creatives. Unless noticed, unless noted, this is just my opinion. If you have questions, please consult a lawyer who knows this stuff, who works with this stuff every single day. When it is something that, it, so I'm gonna share both opinions, I'm gonna share stories, and I'm gonna share actually the law itself. When it is the law itself, I'll tell you. I'll be real clear, I am, I am reading the law. And by the way, the law itself is the copyright law of 1976. And this law, um, because it is law is public, meaning you can copy it. Now, you don't claim it as your own, but you can copy it without permission. You can put it in like my white paper uh, th uh, that I have here. In fact, I will quickly share my screen with you so you know what I'm talking about. And I'll probably do this throughout, especially when I'm reading. But this area that you can see here in the gray with the blue text. Tell me real quick if you're seeing that. Usually my screen shows me in green what's included and there is no green box around it. So, so as long as you, you can see it, then I'll keep on going. Um, but uh, uh, this area that's in the gray box with the blue text, this is actual copyright law from directly from the copyright law of 1976. Other things here that that uh, that you may or may not see, because I'm going to go back and forth between showing you what I've written and and not boring you with, you know, black ink on maybe, white paper. Maybe mm -hmm. zoom in a little bit on that. Um, that way they can kind of see that a little clearer. I can absolutely do that. Let's see. Zoom in. Let's see what 200 percent will do for us. Woo. Does that fill the screen? Nice. All right, let's go over this real quick. Copyright, what is it? Why does it exist? According to the copyright law of 1976, copyright is a form of protection provided by the laws of the US. And I'll title US code, all that kind of stuff. I don't think we care about those. Uh, to the authors of original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, artistic photographs, and certain other intellectual works. This protection is available to both published and unpublished works. Uh, the uh, Section 106 of 1976 Copyright Act generally gives the owner of the copyright the exclusive right to do and to authorize others to do the following. Reproduce the works and copies, prepare derivative works based upon the work, distribute copies of the work to the public for sale or other transfer of ownership by rental, lease, lending, and others, display the work publicly. In addition, certain authors of works of visual art have the rights of attribution and integrity as described in section 106, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, it is illegal for anyone to violate any of the rights provided by the copyright law to the owner of the copyright. Put simply, the copyright is the right to copy. The copyright laws have been designed for you as an artist, as a creator. Why are there copyright laws? Well, the cost of research, the cost of your supplies, the uh, amount of time and other efforts, they really add up. You know this. Without the protections guaranteed by our copyright laws, many of the things not just things that you've created, but many of the things we enjoy today and rely upon today would just simply not exist. 
because who wants to put a whole lot of time and money into a project that someone else can simply just take away from them? Here's an example. Let's say you're a photographer and you decide to do Santa pictures at your neighborhood Christmas party. You research what to do. You make a plan. You make a budget. You buy things. You go out and purchase uh, the, the the Santa set. You you uh, pay for for a professional Santa. You definitely want to have a real beard. You make order forms. You get plenty of change for cash buyers. You buy studio lights. You you get everything that you need. Then you go to the party and you realize no one wants to buy pictures because they can do it themselves with their cell phone. Well, guess what? That's protected. If they take pictures, even if it's of their own kid, believe it or not, it's illegal without your permission. Here's the rule. You can't take what someone else is selling. If I, as a photographer, am selling Santa pictures of your kid, you can't take that from me. You can't take away my right to sell it to you by doing it yourself. Part of the reason the government has, why, why this law exists is because the government wants their cut. And if you do it yourself, they don't get one. So that's one small thing that's to our advantage as creators. Need another example? Let's say you're photographing a wedding. You've just set up a group for a photograph, making sure that everyone's in, in, in place, just right. Making sure you can see each and every single face, moving people around to make sure that this happens. Then five, 10 other people with their cameras, family members, take out their cameras and photograph what you just set up. Believe it or not, that's illegal too. It happens all the time, of course. That doesn't make it illegal. They cannot legally take what it is that you are selling. Now, let's talk about the, that's the law. Let's talk about practical and how to actually deal with a situation like that real quick. I don't recommend pointing it out to them. No, it's going to cause greater problems. They're going to get angry. And there's no reason to make them angry. So therefore, here's what I do. I allow them to do it, but I control how they do it. And the way I control it is real simple. I say, all right, I'm about to, to, to take this photograph and I want you to get it too. I know that they're there for that purpose. They have their camera, their cell phone in their hand. So I want you to get it too. However, there's two really good reasons and I know you'll agree with both of these reasons. There's two really good reasons why you shouldn't do it at the same time I'm doing it. Why you should wait until after I'm done, just a moment after I'm done, a second or two. But there's a, two really good reasons to not do it at the same time or even before. The same time, the reason would be this first one, I'm going to do a countdown. I'm going to say one, two, three, to let them know when I'm about to do the photograph. If you create your image at the exact same time I do and your flash goes off, you've changed my lighting. That's a problem. Not only for the photographer, but for the bride that hired the photographer. She wants those photographs to look good. If there's too much light, they're too bright. This is a problem. Now, if it's a little bit too much light, you could probably fix it. But why bother? Tell them ahead of time. The second thing, you have been in this situation where you've been part of the group and a bunch of people are photographing you. I would imagine you've been part of that. I, I've been in a group before where there were several people photographing it. I did not know which camera to look at. So therefore, in the photographs, you've got people looking at the right camera and you've got people looking over at that camera over there and that camera over there and that one over there. Yeah, all the eyes are going in different directions because they don't know which camera to look at first. I make this very clear by saying, I want everyone, I'm talking to the group of people I'm about to photograph, I want everyone to look at me for this first one. When my flash goes off, I'm going to take a look at it, make sure I like it. But during that time, everyone else who's here is going to be photographing you. But for this first one, their cameras are going to be down so you know which camera to look at so that all your eyes are looking at the same place. And every time I've said that, they've been cool. No one has ever argued. No one's ever given me a hard time about it. By the way, those folks who are doing their photographs would never have bought them from me anyway. 
So that's why I make that accommodation because I want them to have it. Whether they're planning on buying it from me or not, it's their family, their friends. I want them to have it. So I solve the problem in the way I just described. You might have any questions about how I do that before I keep on moving on. Well, Ruben wants to thank you uh, for those great tips because he really liked uh, the way you uh, gave him some uh, handling points. Nice. Anybody else, any questions? And you can, uh, guys, you can use that chat feature right there down at the bottom and uh, let us know your questions. And Thanks we'll for saying that, Ruben. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, Jim. How many times you have been in, I have a big family. So that happens quite often. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's a quince going on this weekend. So uh, I can picture the same situation already happening. So that's a great way to negotiate, you know, uh, what is it that you're doing and why? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for uh, stepping up and saying that. I appreciate it. All right. Is, were there any others I needed to? No? Okay, cool. Excellent. Now, a little bit of history. This started long before 1976 that creators were bothered that their stuff was easily taken. Uh, and, and so there was an international convention called the Bern Convention. And it's spelled almost like Bernie, just without the O. Uh, for those of you who live here in San Antonio, Texas, there's a suburb called Bernie, B-O-E-R-N-E. -E. This is the Bern Convention, B-E-R-N-E. -E. The Bern Convention for Protection of Literary and artistic work. So it was a little bit more limited than the, our, the laws we have here in the US. But this was first adopted way back in 1886. And the Berne Convention is an agreement to honor the rights of all authors who are from countries that, were, that had signed the convention. Uh, the current version of the Paris Act of 1971 with an amendment in 79 is where it's at now. The uh, convention is administered by the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, W-I-P-O, uh, which is a, a good organization to, to uh, look into. They, they have a, a website, and a little bit later, I'll share that with you, WIPO. Uh, who can claim copyright? Now, I'm going back to sharing my screen because this is actual words from the Copyright Law of 1976. Who can claim copyright? Copyright protection subsists from the time the work is created in fixed form. The copyright in the work of authorship immediately becomes the property of the author who created the work. Only the author or those deriving their rights through the author can rightfully claim copyright. In the case of works made for hire, this would be, uh, photographers do this if they're, they photograph weddings, they often hire second shooters. No, they don't always call them second shooters, but that's the, that's what most, that's generally what they're called, uh, second shooters. Who owns the right to the work that can, the second shooter does? According to the law of 19, the copyright law of 1976, it is the photographer who hired the second shooters. Meaning those photographers must give those images to the hired photographer, the, the main one that was hired by the bride and groom upon completion of the job. And they do not retain any rights to those images whatsoever. Meaning that that original photographer, the, the main photographer, could use their work as examples of their work. Yeah, I know that one's kind of weird, but that is what that means. Now, most photographers, when they hire second shooters, actually don't use those photographs unless there's something real specific that they need that photograph for. And there's a lot of reasons why this would be a, a good, smart thing. But the reason why they need control of, over copyright is because they are showing these images to the bride and groom. And if they have images from a, a photographer or two or three who aren't, they're not able to sell those photographs to, that would put the bride and groom at a disadvantage because they'd have to go to the one or two or three or however many other photographers just to see all their photographs. This is a real pain besides it's covered under the copyright law. Those images belong to the, the contracted photographer for the event, period. A lot of photographers do what's called bragging rights. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little while. And that's where they do give rights to the, uh, to the, those second shooters. So we do have a uh, question of YouTube, uh, Jim, and I guess this would go with product photography. Um, okay. the question is, uh, 
like framing and stuff like that. Uh, for instance, how we use frame moldings and stuff. Um, are people allowed to use product photography that's on a website? Um, how, how does that work when it's product photography and it's in a resale? And James, you might be able to chime in here. I know we allow um, basically photographers and artists to use the verbiage and uh, kind of type product shots that we have off of our site. Um, but how does it work for product photographers that, that have that contract with say a company? Because I'm, I'm guessing once a company contracts a photographer and that now the company owns the rights to those product shots, correct? Yes, they do. Yeah, the company that hired the photographer uh, for commercial purposes has to be able to share those themselves. They have to be able to print them or do whatever it is that they need to do. And so they will purchase those rights from that, that uh, commercial photographer uh, in whatever form the commercial photographer wants. They are the ones who are in control, but they've got to sell it to some degree in order for their client to be able to use it. So therefore, uh, it could be some type of limited rights, and we're going to be talking about limited rights here in just a little bit, um, where it's used uh, or, or single use rights, or maybe first use rights. We're, again, we're going to talk about all these in just a bit. Um, but the uh, uh, this is something that some the images that are used commercially, they really need to pay attention to this because there's uh, there's even more things that you can more tools that can be used. Uh, but one of those is how those rights are shared with the uh, with the uh, the company that uh, you're, you're, is your client. So uh, it just, it depends on how you set that up. You're in control, but they get some type of rights. You're going to sell them some type of rights with that. And we'll talk about what those different things are here in just a little bit. Uh, Jim, so we have a question from someone. This is kind of an, an interesting uh, dilemma that I, I guess you could call it, um, you know, Artists, for instance, uh, that you know, they it, the same principles of copyright um, apply to an artist that is Can you bring it to me? creating a painting. Um, so th these 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 are very applicable to artists. Okay, uh, however, a lot of times artists are are painting or uh, having a ph professional photographer photograph their artwork. So the question is, and, and I think it's a very interesting question, and, and uh, I think I know the answer to this. Well, oh, yeah. I don't know the answer, to it, but I, I want I want to hear what you have to say. Is uh, if they are a painter and the photographer photographs their artwork, what rights does the photographer have to that photo? Do they own the copyright to that photo? So that's a commercial mm -hmm. job. Uh, that uh, is identical to the, the question before, actually. Um, the, uh, the, um, the artist that did the painting is hiring, is, is a commercial client, just like if you uh, sell boxes of, I don't know, uh, cheese wafers. I don't know where that came from. Um, that uh, is, if the, this cheese wafer company has created a box and they've asked the photographer to photograph it, does the photographer now own the rights to the box? Of course not. Nope. They don't. Do they have the ability to sell those photographs anywhere else? No, they do not because someone else already owns that. Um, so in a case when someone else already owns it, that entity already keeps it. It's kind of like with photographing models. Can you sell that work? You can use it for marketing purposes, but you can't sell it without their permission because it's got their likeness on it. You can't profit off of someone else's likeness without permission. That's a model release. Unless they're in the, yes, that's a model release. Unless they're in the public domain. Now, who's that? Politicians. You can follow, photograph any politician, local, national, doesn't matter. You can photograph any of them and make money off of it because they've placed themselves in the public domain. So the photographer who photographs the artist's work has no rights to the, that image other than for... They have marketing rights. Marketing. Bragging rights. Yeah, they can put it on their website. But they cannot reproduce, reprint no, that, you know, for the purpose of selling it as a, as a print. So if I, I do that, if I'm a photographer and I photograph an artist's artwork and uh, I said, you know, Hey, that's, that's, a, you know, that, that photograph of that artwork uh, came out pretty good. I'm going to go print that artist's artwork and sell it 
you know, down the street in some gallery, even though it's not my artwork, I photographed it. I can't do that. Totally illegal. Okay. Same yeah. thing with photographing a building uh, that's just one building. Now, if it's the entire city skyline, that's a different story. One building, the architect or someone owns it. Uh, uh, the um, Who owns the skyline? Generally speaking, no one owns a skyline. There and are so, examples where that's not the case, but for the most part, it's public. And, and we, we did have an example once where uh, someone photographed a a uh, business and it had the uh, business owner's logo, uh, their, their sign, and it was very picturesque, beautiful photograph. And it looked great, uh, but it had the person's logo and their, their business, the front of their business. And the uh, business owner saw that that print was being sold. And he had, uh, now, we, we didn't get into the weeds with it, but, you know, we, we asked the art, the photographer to take it down and not sell it, um, at least on our platform. But uh, the uh, it sounds to me that the uh, photographer really didn't have the rights to sell that, you know, you know, that photo in the format that he was photographing. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this also, you know, um, kind of like when worlds collide sort of thing. I, I've worked with mural artists for a long time, and uh, that sometimes that gets classified as public art. Uh, I think there's a case with either BMW or Mercedes Benz where the dealership of a Mercedes or BMW used it, um, but on the building next to their lot was this fantastic mural. So they had the cars, you know, angled up. Um, professional photographer came in and got to shoot the the cars all lined up with that mural backdrop. Um, and I know there was that lawsuit again because they're using the art of the the mural in the background. It was a nice background, but um, that runs in with a lot of mural artists. So I know, like Austin, Austin has awesome murals all over. And if you go to any Austin gift shop. It is, you will find coasters, mugs, prints of a lot of the murals. None of that goes to the mural artist, it goes to the photographer yeah. who makes prints of it. So where does that, where does that, who owns the rights then again with that when it's something considered public art? I mean, public yeah. art is commissioned by someone. Is it the building owner that then owns? It could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it very well could be. I, there's, there's more than just a simple answer to that. So I'm probably not going to give you the, the, uh, the best answer or the most complete answer. Um, but it is possible that it is public. It's entirely possible that it's public and anyone can use that because it's out in public. It's kind of like, if you are out in public, there is no expectation of privacy. So therefore you can be photographed. It's just someone can't make a profit off of your likeness unless it's part of a group. This, if, you're, if there's uh, an event downtown and uh, people are um, sharing their opinion about something and there's just a large group of people, um, then anyone can photograph that group of people and sell those images because it's a big group. But if it's only one person out there, then you're selling their likeness. Mm -hmm. And so there is some gray area because if they're in a public place, this kind of opens them up to being able to do that. But uh, it would if if it's the likeness that it is you're selling, then you've got to get their permission. If it's the story that it is that you're selling and it has to be obvious to people other than yourself, mm -hmm. then that's where you might be in the public rather than the individual. Good to know. I know photographers um, with running geo galleries, uh, I kind of run into this with photographers who want to sell prints. Uh, say these are prints, photos of Marilyn Monroe. Well, I know they're not the photographer that shot these because one, they're my age. So <laughs> uh, they have it and they're like, well, I've also changed the image. Um, and I know there's like degrees of changing stuff that, you know, makes. Yeah, that's called a derivative work. And, uh, and if you can still tell that it's her, it's not derivative enough. It hasn't been changed enough. 
Derivative um, implies that the original creator can't even tell it's theirs any longer. Mm -hmm. So if the original creator can tell, it's not a derivative work yet. Yeah, it's kind of Once like... it has been changed to the point where it is a derivative work, then it, that copyright now becomes yours as the creator. And so if you, if you take a, an image online and you paint it, but you uh, change it enough where the painter, the, the photographer uh, can't, there's just no way they could tell it was theirs. Maybe change the angle, maybe change the, the way the sunlight hits things, then it could become your own work. So it just, it just depends on, on how it's created. Yeah. I mean, cause I've seen that a lot. I mean, people who have used the photographic works of variety photographers, Rolling Stone photographers, and have taken the image, you know, minus the verbiage of the, of the publication and, you know, maybe gone in and painted it, turned it black and white from a color or turned it completely to color um, and tried to sell that as their own print again being from those publications i mean there's disney runs into it a lot but um yeah. taking the works and making for lack of a better word a little bit of a knockoff you know of the uh of the copyright if, if it devalues even even if it does uh, uh even if it is a derivative if it devalues the original work and the the original um uh, creator's ability to make money with it, that is also illegal. You can't devalue someone else's. So if now the, the profits that are coming in now get split between two different companies, two different individuals, you have taken away that original creator's ability to make, to make the money that they would have made had you not done that. Yeah, there's some gray area here though, um, because you only keep your copyright from 70 years after it was created or after death, I'm sorry, after death. So works that are really old may be by definition in the public domain, but they also could have had it renewed by whoever owned it after them, generally kids. Yeah. There's a lot of variables here. Don't you love variables? Yeah, and I mean, in every case, I want to say is there's so it is almost a case by case basis, it seems like, or at least it's argued a lot. I mean, uh, what one person has said, okay, well, they've said this in, uh, you know, Disney, I, I want to say is the most hardcore with their characters. Um, I, I've worked with Disney licensed artists before. And I mean, anything they paint, changing the color of Minnie's outfit, uh, a new outfit for Mickey, anything like that has to go through a whole entire approval process. And if they don't like it along that approval, it gets trashed. That's, I mean, that's the sad part of it. It's destroyed art um, if it doesn't meet the approval process. Um, and same thing with the photography of their characters. There's a uh, again, because it's an image Disney has there that they're very protective of all of the stuff that uh, people go out, they they use movie stills and try to sell, you know, the mugs and stuff like that. Um, Disney's a hardcore one to go up against and they have the money <laughs> to go oh, after. Oh yeah, they do. Um, so I, I always warn people if I do see something coming across like that, like, uh, well, you know, movie stills are great, but movie stills are still belong to Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, Disney characters all belong to Disney. And that's just a copyright war. You don't want to go down. Mm -hmm. It really right. is. So, um, uh, but uh, uh, like I said, case by case thing on it. And that's what I, I like that you're presenting this because there's so many, like you're saying, shades of gray. There sure are. I'll let you continue. <laughs> uh, I'll share uh, my screen with, um, a few more words directly from the, the law. And so mere ownership of a photograph or any other copy does not give the possessor copyright any more than music. If you own, if you've bought music, does that mean you now can sell the music? No, not unless you've bought the rights also. Uh, so the law provides that transfer of ownership of any material object that embodies a protected work does not itself convey any rights to copyright or for uh, rights in the copyright. So how to secure a copyright? 
uh, copyrighted secured automatically upon creation. The way in which copyright protection is secured is frequently misunderstood. No publication or registration or other action of the Copyright Office is required to secure copyright. There are, however, certain definite advantages to registration of your work. And I mentioned this a, a little before, but I'll say it again. As with all photographic images or any creation, the, the copyright belongs to the creator the moment it's created. And in, in, in the instance of photographer, the moment the film or image sensor records the image. And it actually lives 70 years longer than you. Now, when it comes to notice of copyright, before 1989, you used to actually have to state it is copyrighted. But since 1989, it's just an automatic. Everything is copyrighted with a period at the end of that sentence, unless it is stated that it is public domain or something else. So the use of the copyright notice is no longer required under US law although it is often beneficial. Because prior law did not contain such a requirement, however, the use of notice is still relevant to the copyright status of older works. Notice was required under the 1976 Copyright Act. This requirement, however, was eliminated when the United States adhered to the Berne Convention that was effective March 1st, 1989. Use of the notice may be important because it informs the public that the work is protected by copyright. It identifies the copyright owner and shows the first year of publication when it was created. Furthermore, in the event that a work is infringed, if a proper notice of copyright appears on the published copy or, uh, or copies to which a defendant in a copyright infringement suit had access, then no weight shall be given to such a defendant's interposition of a defense based on innocent infringement in mitigation of actual or statutory damages, Whew. except as provided in section 504. Okay, you can read that on your own. Innocent infringement occurs when the infringer did not realize that the work was protected. In other words, no weight is given if you didn't realize it was copyrighted. Too bad. Ignorance is not an excuse. Yeah, I think people use the word, use ignorance as an excuse all the time. Well, I didn't know that. Well, you could have looked it up. You could have done some research. So therefore, so what? You didn't know. That's how it works. Form of notice for visually perceptible copies. The notice for visually, visually perceptible copies should contain all the following elements. The symbol circle C, the word copyright or the abbreviation of the word copyright, COPR period, and the first year of publication of the work. In the case of complications or derivative works, incorporating previously published material, the year date of first publication of the compilation or derivative work is sufficient. And the name of the owner of the copyright in the work or an abbreviation by which the name can be recognized or a generally known alternative designation of the owner. Now, you see this example here at the bottom where it says example, Circle C, 2010 John Doe. So if you have a business name, then it needs to be your business entity here. Or it could be your business entity here. It could still be your name. I further suggest, even though it's not written in the copyright law, I absolutely further suggest that you include geographical information. So for me, mine would say Circle C, 2021 Landers Photography, San Antonio, Texas, USA. That's what my full copyright looks like. Now, I want you to know how to make the circle C on your computer. If you have a Mac, hold down option and at the same time press G. That'll give you the circle C. If you have a PC, hold down control and alt at the same time as you're pressing C. I have noticed on some PCs that doesn't do anything or it actually does something different. Here's one that is, always works and I just do it because it always works. Hold down alt and type in 0169. So alt plus 0169. I'm going to copy that and put that in the chat so you guys have that. So give me a second to do that. 
All right, so the, the how to get a Circle C for uh, for printing purposes is, is now in the chat for those of you who are, are watching uh, via Zoom. So let's go over real quickly what's not covered by copyright. There's fair use, uh, as long as it doesn't harm the value of the work. And there's public domain, which on search engines you're going to see called Creative Commons. Creative Commons. Uh, nothing created since 1989 is in the public domain, like I mentioned before, unless the owner specifically put it there in writing. The owner would have to write, I grant this to the public domain in some form or fashion. When doing an online search, you may choose to search under Creative Commons. If you're going to be using that as an uh, inspiration for the work you're going to be doing, uh, I have done that many times where I am, especially in a class, I, I will seek out a, an image real quick and then in class put that image up and I'll make plenty of changes to it to the point where I guarantee you, there's no way the original creator would have a clue that that was their work anymore. At that moment, it becomes a derivative work. But you may, you may think, well, it's Creative Commons. That means it's public domain, right? Don't hold your breath. They could, the, the search could be wrong. Don't rely on the, the online searches to, to help you there. Uh, to, to put you in the right direction, maybe. But again, ignorance is not a good excuse for not knowing the law. So even if it's in Creative Commons. So Jim, so uh, it reminds me of a question that that uh, I've, I've had occasionally and uh, you may have as well is what if you're using a photo as a reference to make an original piece so take a picture of something uh, or you, you or you find a picture a photograph say online of a nice mountain stream and you decide i'm going to create a pencil sketch or an oil painting based upon that yeah um this is potentially it could work. This is also potential gray area where it doesn't, because if it's if it um, if it's different enough, then it, it's an irrelevant thing. Uh, however, uh, if it's similar enough where someone can tell the difference, if it is if if it is harming the value of the original work, in other words, some people are saying, "Oh, I'd like to have that pencil drawing of it." This is actually taking away from the original um, owners, original creators ability to sell the work. Some of that money that would have come to them would be um, uh, directed over to some other creator. That's where it crosses the line. So likewise, what if you were to, uh, and this is uh, something, this has been an area of, of debate uh, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it where someone takes an image uh, that a photographer uh, created, they bring it into Photoshop and apply like an artistic filter. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you knew the answer that, to that, that question. That's, you see that all the time I, on Instagram. I, I, I agree with that. Um, that it is. Uh, how do we? The the. Let, let me ex explain. How how do we explain that? Mm, okay. to the person so here in lies a problem that, we... that is unique to social media when you up your upload your images and your creations to social media you when you signed up for that social media or as they make changes um, but anyway you have agreed to the fine print and in social media that means you are sharing your rights with that social media company because they have to have the ability to share your work and allow others to see your work. And because they have to have that, they have to have this fine print in there and in, in what you've signed with them that allows them to be able to share it too. And it also means, and you're not going to like this part of it, anything you upload to Facebook, Instagram, any, any of those, they can put that in their own stock photography um, uh, database and sell your work to anybody because you effectively gave them the right to do that because that's what you agreed to in the fine print. It's a good reason to, it, it, that 
is makes it a good reason to put your copyright or some type of watermark on every single image you put online. Yes, I know there's a lot of people who say, well, that makes the work look less. I, it, it degrades the work. Okay. If you care about this, if you don't care, then you keep on doing it the way you're doing it. But if this is something that does uh, concern you, then you really do need a watermark on your work because when someone is going through those databases of images, they're going to see that copyright and say, oh, I don't want that. And they just move on. And so it doesn't make it where they can't, it, that Facebook or whatever can't sell it. They can't. It just makes it where the person who's going to be buying it is unlikely to choose it. So it's just an extra layer of protection that doesn't protect completely. Does that help? Or did I go off on a tangent? Well, I, I, I wanted, I was wondering more like I was, I was picturing a scenario where, uh, uh, I was, let's say I find a photograph, uh, uh, you know, online, not necessarily on social media, but just, uh, I, I find that someone posted on their website and the, the scenario I was in, I've, I've seen is they, they take this photo, maybe it's an iconic photo that's still protected by copyright and they apply a, a Photoshop filter to make it look like a pencil sketch, or they make it look like a, uh, a given an oil painting effect. Um, so it's kind of like it, it kind of like the same scenario where someone is taking a photograph uh, uh, that they find and they're creating an original oil painting with it. But how does that, does that same principle apply when you are utilizing a program like Photoshop to create a digitized oil painting or a digital oil painting? Um, so they're modifying the, the uh, original photo to make it look very different, but it's based upon that original photo. At what point does copyright, where, you know, where does, uh, where does the well, copyright reside? Who does the copyright reside with or how is it's it? It's the original creator for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there is gray area here and part of it is because most most uh, uh, copyright owners don't do anything. And so therefore, you know, could someone do that? Mm -hmm. Could they do it and get away with it? Even if it is illegal? Uh-huh. Yeah, of course they could. Uh, and some will do it knowing it's illegal. And it, yeah. So yeah. Uh, if the, uh, if the original creator, here's the, the, the for sure. If the original creator can look at the derivative work, and recognize it as, hey, that's from my photograph or that's from my painting. If they recognize it, then they have the potential to go after you in court. And whether they're right or whether you, whether you lose or not, you're still going to be investing time and money into defending what you believe, or you're going to be backing off one of the two, but it's still, why bother going there? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and it I think in some cases it's like, you know, the um, do it and ask permission or what is it? Ask for forgiveness later. Mm -hmm. uh, and that comes usually, I think, in the form of the cease and desist letter because yes. copyright starts to be, um, I think usually what you're hit first is the cease and desist letter. Um, and Potentially. Yep. And then uh, so a lot of people kind of risk it. I think, and then go ahead and say, okay, well, you know, if I get anything, if they complain, they come at me. It's usually the cease and desist before they hit you with a really big loss, unless you're doing something like running multi-million dollar shirts, you know, you're getting the, the shirts are done, the, you've got bags, you have, and you've now made, yeah. you know, considerable amount of change. Then then you'll be hit more likely with the lawsuit first <laughs> before the cease and desist. That could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, right. th I think for most photographers, most artists, uh, what they're going to find is the cost to, um, you know, to to seek out damages is going yeah. to be more than what they're likely going to be able to get in damages. Correct. I think it was a intellectual pro uh, properties lawyer. They think that's the people that you talked to for. Yeah copyright stuff and um 
I think when I spoke to him, I know it was like just for the consultation part was going to be like two hundred dollars an hour just to start, you know. Oh sure, sure. Uh, just to get the consultation of what I would need per pieces uh, for artists that I represented, and I'm like, wow, that's a lot. But you know, there there's something. Uh, eventually, I want to do something that would umbrella stuff. So it's like, okay, well, when I get to that just, point, we'll pay our two hundred dollars. You know, that figure out whether or not there's going to be the you know the the cost benefit. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, and, and and many times, uh, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, is that uh, it's it's just someone using your your image does not necessarily mean that there has been damages that can be monetized. That's true. So you have to also you, show. You do in most situations have to prove that there are some type of financial damages, uh, and without that, there's. Then not a whole lot that can be done any further. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. So and you're let's... getting thanks on YouTube, uh, Jim, as well from Cynthia there. She's loving oh. everything covering um, here on there. So thanks, just Cynthia. Thanks to you. Thank you. Cool. Uh, and let me go over a couple of uh, several different types of copyrights. Uh, first of all, you should define the proper usage of your images in your wording, in your contract. And, uh, you know, there's, I think there's sometimes when people say, should there, do I need a contract here? Um, I, I suppose in certain situations, you absolutely don't. Um, but there are many times when you do. Photographers, I think, should do it every time now. Now, if we were talking 30 years ago, there weren't a whole lot that were doing it because a handshake would do it. But now, most of the time a handshake still will do it but there's so many times it won't so i'm recommending that at least you guys that are photographers every single time you work with a client whether that's a, a company or an individual get a contract how you, you have to create it yourself and you get them to sign it um, copyright cannot be lost it can only be given away but we want to make sure that our client understands what it is we're selling because we're just a tool from the shelf and they're picking the best tool for their job. And so we need to go, do a good job of describing what kind of tool we are. And when we do that, we wind up with happy clients. When we fail to do that, we wind up with people who are happy at first and then discover things later and then become very angry. So make sure you do good, a good job of describing what kind of tool you are so they can make a decision as to whether they want to take you off the shelf or not. But the different types of copyright, there's eight and I've added my own a ninth. Number one, exclusive photo rights. Exclusive, meaning you're only selling it to one, one entity, one individual, one group. Number two, one time or lease right where you're selling it to some someone for uh, for them to be able to use one time for one purpose one use or lease rights where it's a period of time that they're able to use it and then at the end of that period of time they no longer own it number three is electronic or online media where you can sell the rights for purposes of only on the web email digital form that's the only use you're selling it for um, there is a different, there is a good reason to, um, the photographers probably know this, but, um, you, to optimize a photograph for web purposes, you have to actually reduce its size, but for print purposes, you need a larger file because it it just plain takes more pixels to make a print look good than it does to make a screen image look good. You just don't need as much information. So electronic or print or, or online. The number four is print rights. Now, what does that mean? Print, that they can print it for whatever purpose you have deemed appropriate. For instance, when, when I sell digital files, I also add in for up to eight by 10 prints. And part of the reason there is because I have to optimize or I should optimize my prints for those larger sizes. So eight by 10 and smaller, that, that's tiny, that's small. I mean, that's, that's stuff that goes on a desk. Um, and then wall print start at like 16 by 20 and up. Um, but I, I, need, I need control over those because I want my work to be as I intended it. 
So therefore I give certain rights if I do sell my, my digital files and I don't usually sell my digital files, I will. They're $350 each, each, not per job. Each image is $350. Uh, so, and that's me, you'd charge whatever you want to. There's, I've come across people who think that's ridiculously low and I've come across more that think, oh gosh, really? People are paying for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, by the way, you photographers that are selling your digital files for less than your prints, what the heck are you doing? Your digital files have much more value than the print. The print's just one. How many can they print with those digital files? Unless you specify, they can print as many as they want. Yeah, your digital files are way more valuable. Those of you who are film photographers, you know how valuable your negatives are. What's the difference? Nothing. The difference really is your clients know how to use it. There are more clients who know how to use digital files and know how to use film. So that's the main difference. Sorry to pick on you guys. Um, you have a question from Mike here who's asking, how do you find a decent copyright lawyer here in Texas? Is there anyone you use, uh, James, uh, Jim? Anyway, so my first suggestion, and by the way, it, later in this presentation, I'm going to answer that question, but I'm answering for you right now. Um, first thing I would go to is ppa.com. Professional Photographers of America. That's for photographers. Now, the, it the, also further on in this, uh, in this, I'm going to show you something that's for everybody, not just photographers. But uh, uh, there's uh, for photographers. There's something. There's a, a company called the Law Tog. L A W T O G, short for photographer. So the Law Tog. dot com, uh, and uh, they have lots of different legal documents written by lawyers. Actually, the person who owns it is a photographer and a lawyer. This person is, does, has both, wears both hats. So good stuff, not cheap, but you don't want the cheapest legal advice. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, on the art side, I know too, a lot of people, um, if you have a cultural arts department in your municipality, often um, if you kind of go watch what they're gonna have for the year, it's, uh, almost every year, there's at least one copyright and a uh, uh, topic that comes up uh, during the municipalities, um, kind of uh, kind of like what we're doing here, like a little forum. And uh, that's also a good way too, to see who uh, the city invites to kind of speak on those uh, uh, pieces. I know here in San Antonio, when I've gone for the city of San Antonio, they've used Gunley and Cave PC, which is intellectual property law firm. Um, and I've seen him speak a couple of times there, uh, Nick, uh, Gwen, and, uh, he's, he's pretty good. And you know what, they're also willing to tell you, <laughs> these are other, uh, other lawyers that you could seek out as well. So, um, FYI, sure. your, your, um, cultural arts department for your city, they, they probably have some, um, uh, legal, uh, some legal, uh, places that you can go ahead and seek out for that information as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's good. All right, on the types of copyrights, we've gone over one, exclusive rights. Number two, one-time or lease rights. Number three, electronic or online media. Number four, print rights. And that brings us to number five, all rights. Effectively, you're just selling every single, anything to them. They can do anything they want for as long as they want. It's actually no longer yours at that point. You don't own the rights once you've sold all the rights. The entity you sold it to now does. Number six, first rights. Uh, this works a lot with um, uh, publications, uh, especially like magazines or different news organizations. They may want the, the, the first rights but a lot of them were actually exclusive where you're only selling it to them. But there are some that will say, and, and this is a lesser cost if you're going to sell it to them. First rights just means you sell it to them first. It doesn't mean that they're the only ones you sell it to. It just means you're going to sell it to them first. That's first rights. Number seven is transfer. We're going to talk about transfer a little bit more in just a moment. Transfer rights. Uh, and number eight, work for hire. Work for hire, which isn't any rights at all. Uh, 
but I said I made up an, another one that's number nine and that's bragging rights. So that's where the work for hire comes in. Um, this is made up, this is, I have heard it from other people too, but I, I made this up. This does not exist in the copyright law. This is when you're working with another photographer. Someone has hired the photographer uh, as a second shooter and they give you rights to use the images for your own marketing which is when I hire a second, a second shooter, I absolutely give them bragging rights. They, they, can't, they don't have any rights to sell the images because I have to have those rights so that the, the bride doesn't have to, if it's a wedding, so the bride doesn't have to go to two, three, four different photographers to get their photographs and get confused by that. They, 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 just the one that they hired, that's it. As far as they're concerned, the others are employees. Employees do not own the rights to the things they create, generally speaking. By the way, there are exceptions to this, but they would come in the form of a contract. And if it's not explicitly written in the contract, you don't own the rights to the stuff that you create as a employee, your employer does. And that's what this effectively is. But I like to give bragging rights to the, the people that work for me um, because I want them to be able to use those images in their portfolio. This, this, th these images are examples of their work and they have to start somewhere. And generally speaking, you don't want a photographer to start photographing weddings by just starting photographing weddings. A photographer who's gonna start doing weddings should start working with other photographers to learn what it is they're supposed to do. Now I said I was gonna come back to transfer of copyright. This is, this next section is straight from the, uh, the copyright law, so I'm going to share it. Uh, transfer of copyright right here in the blue, any or all of the copyright owner's exclusive rights or any subdivision of those rights may be transferred. But the transfer of exclusive rights is not valid unless the transfer is in writing and signed by the owner of the rights conveyed or such owner's duly authorized agent. Transfer of a right on a non-exclusive basis does not require written agreement. A copyright may be conveyed by operation of law and may be bequeathed by will or passed as personal property to the applicable laws of interstate succession. Copyright is a personal property right and is subject to the various state laws and regulations that govern the ownership, inheritance, or transfer of personal property, as well as the terms of contracts or conduct or conduct of business, conduct of business. For information, about relevant state laws, consult an attorney. Transfer of copyright are normally made by contract. Transfer of rights. Now, when I am transferring my rights to some degree, I don't usually ever, it's very rare that I do all rights. But when I do, here's an example of what I do with my photographic images. So this area in the gray, you can see it's dated, uh, it's a future date, but still. Uh, an extension of copyright usage rights. This is how they are able to use the extension of my copyright. Here's how they can use it. And I state, just so they know, I don't assume that people know this. As with all photographic images, the copyright belongs to the photographer the moment the film or image sensor records the image. Therefore, this document serves to extend the usage rights of these images created on the date for whatever the company or individual's name is. And then you list the images or image that you are extending those usage rights to. Now, most of the time this message, and I, I'm noticing that it doesn't have it, uh, but most of the time this also says how they're able to use it. So they're able to use it for any online marketing purpose, or they're able to use it for any print size up to eight by 10, uh, so there's different things that I will uh, uh, narrow their use for so that they're very clear on what they can and cannot do. So that's and how I do my extension of copyright. Is that the same or different than licensing? It's a shorter version of licensing, but yeah, it's the same. Yep. Yeah, it's where, where you tell them what they're able to do with your the thing you own, your copyright. Now, to further protect your images. I mentioned this before, and I'm mentioning it again. 
mark your prints as copyrighted. Not because you need to by law, but because you need to by people's understanding of the law. People do understand the circle C with a date and your name and the geographical information. People understand that. If there's nothing there, they don't know the law. Therefore, they could assume that it isn't copyrighted. And you just want to avoid that. So I recommend that you put your copyright information on all of the prints that you create. Um, Ruben asks, will the metadata uh, data suffice? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question, Ruben. I don't think I included that in this. Um, yes and no. Oh, don't you hate answers like that? Um, okay, so yes, it sure does. Until the point when it doesn't. Well, when is that? Mm. Another thing you're not going to like about social media is when you upload your images, they take off your metadata. They effectively make it an orphaned work. By law, if it's an orphaned work, people are allowed to share it. So therefore, they create, they effectively make every single thing you upload an orphaned work. Social media. Yeah, but they have to. For us, they don't have uh, a choice. Works uh, using Unbox. We we, uh, we love when our customers mention us and their unboxing things, but uh, because of all that, I was always so worried sharing other artists' uh, work. I actually started keeping the artist, uh, their social media tag on there and, and having our Final Works Unbox on there. But more that I kept that the art, this was who the artist was um, on there had always been really important for me whenever I shared uh, on our platform. So uh, that's interesting to know, like what that it is stripped when it is uploaded to social. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, throw in some additional gasoline on this fire because that's may uh, scare a few people. And I, I, I'm coming from the programmer's perspective that uh, uh, has been in, you know, directly involved in the development of, uh, of, of, of various imaging systems, systems that uh, capture images and transfer them uh, to the web, upload them, is uh, many of these libraries that uh, uh, companies use and or are forced to use because, you know, they, they don't have the ability to, you know, create their, you know, you know, recreate the wheel when it comes to, you know, processing image files. Uh, it's uh, uh, a lot of these, we'll call them code libraries that uh, mainstream software programs that that are used on on the web, they do strip out the metadata. They do not, or they do not include the data. All the the only thing they are interested in is capturing the image information so they can produce appropriate you know files that are uh, can be stored you know on whatever platform that they need to be stored in, whether it be you know uh, on you know. Amazon's web service or, or what have you. Um, so uh, a lot of times the, um, when you upload an image, you know, let's say you, you go to a, a website and you upload your image for whatever reason, maybe it's to share the image, maybe it's to print the image, what have you, is there is the possibility that that service that you are using will strip that metadata. Or if they may not, if, if they're storing the original file, then it, the original file should be okay. But if they're generating smaller web viewable files, uh, there's a good chance that that metadata will be stripped, period. Um, in a case where it's a print on demand company, you don't have to, shouldn't have to worry about that because they're going to need that original file uh, so they can get the best print for the customer. But um, if you are uploading it to any other type of site, then there you do risk like a gallery website uh, where it's just to showcase your work. Um, you do run the risk of uh, losing that data. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, 
to further protect your copyright, I also say that you should write your contact information on the print. Uh, now, how do you do that? This is up to you. I'm going to tell you how I do it, though. Um, on the back of each one of my prints, um, on the front, I, I sign it. So it's, and it's, uh, I have gold foil and a heated ballpoint pen. And so I sign in gold, which is kind of cool to be able to say that you sign in gold. You can do that too if you want. Um, yeah, steal that one from me. Um, but on the back, I have a sticker that has our contact information on it. And then I write in the job number and the image number so that it's easily identifiable. If they want another print for some reason, they can call me and tell me exactly what it is that they want rather than having to describe it to me. And hopefully I remember what it is that they're talking about. Uh, after a while, we have created lots and lots and lots of images. I don't actually know how many images we've created. I, I know that we have uh, photographed well over 200,000 people. So I, I don't know how many images have been created over the last, uh, I started in the part-time in 1983 and full-time in 1991. So we've created a lot of images in that time. Uh, I'm not gonna remember everything. And for the most part, people never do contact us for additional prints, but when they do, we're ready to go. We've got it, we can find it. Assuming they had it printed. If it was never printed, then it could be a little difficult to find just because of the number of jobs. Uh, next thing is include copyright information in your contract. We've talked about that before, but I'm repeating it. This way infringements can be dealt with with not just a federal copyright case, but also as contract violation. Two ways. Include a copyright statement in each print order that reminds your client that these photographs are protected by copyright and that the customer agrees that reprints will only be ordered from you unless there's other type of permission, which I, I wouldn't include that in there. So yeah, in my, in my packaging, there is a piece of paper that describes what this is, what you can do with it, and what to do. This isn't a slapping on the hand kind of thing. This is all positive. Here's what it is. Here's what you can do. And if you need this, here's how you do it. Once you have all those things done, now go visit your local attorney to review your contract. Definitely get it reviewed. Get all that stuff that's on the legal side reviewed. Anything you choose to include. Um, so, uh, I, I, in addition, I want you to watermark your images, uh, include additional info in the file information in Photoshop that, that EXIF information, you can change it. Photographers, you can go into Photoshop, go to file info. You can make addition, you can put additional things in there. I have my address. I have a URL where my copyright, um, uh, policy is. So all that stuff is there until it gets stripped out by social media, but for other purposes, it's there. Uh, and then here is... The final one, and I'm going to come back to it in a little bit, Re register your photographs with the U.S. Copyright Office. This one is important if you consider this a problem. If you have a photograph or, or any art, if you have a piece registered with the U.S. Copyright Office, you're going to be able to defend it. If you don't, you may or may not be able to defend it. So make it easy for yourself. Take care of going to the, of, of uh, putting it, your images at the copyright office. We're going to talk about how in just a moment. Um, I mentioned derivative work already, so I'm going to skip past that. But that's your your the the original creator's work versus a derivative. The derivative work cannot be recognized by the original creator. That's derivative work. So can you use someone else's image, a photograph or whatever? As inspiration for your own, yes, you can. But do a good job of making it your own so that the original creator doesn't see it as being theirs and you're infringing on their copyrights. You might have to go to court about that or at least hire a lawyer. And even if you win, it's still a pain. All right, if... Uh, oh, you know what, there's also an area about um, uh, photographers uh, can hire digital artists, retouchers, who owns the copyright then, you still own the copyright, you created it. It doesn't matter how much they jazz up your photograph, you still own the copyright to it. Even if it's very different because it's work for hire, you have hired them to jazz up your photograph. 
You own it. They do not. They may have bragging rights because they have to be able to show their work. So marketing rights, but they do not have the ability legally to sell it. Not in the U.S. But what if your retoucher is not in the U.S.? Their laws may be different. So I'm only talking about U.S. If you feel like your copyright has been infringed upon, some people don't do anything about it. Some people do. It's probably a good idea to try to do something about it. Uh, sending that, uh, to, Melissa mentioned a cease and desist, I mean, stop using the work. Uh, sending that first. If that doesn't get you the kind of reaction you want, um, then you, you may have to get legal, um, further the legal. Um, but I think the first thing you should do is not cease and desist. I think the first thing you should do is send them a bill. Just send them a bill. How much would it cost if you were to charge them for it? Just send them that bill. That's and the reason idea. I say that, if they paid it, then I'm happy. So you can, t you can handle it however you want. You can get upset. I think, woohoo, <laughs> I'm sending out an invoice. This is great. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even have to work for it. <laughs> so yeah, I, I sometimes look at things a little differently than other people do. <laughs> yeah. I know artists, again, because we were talking about how much it costs to, to go ahead and, and really you know, enforce that copyright in court and everything. Uh, sometimes a lot, you know, it, it just exceeds what you're going to be able to really give. So what I've seen artists do is basically argue it out in the media, in their local media who owns the copyright uh, for stuff and, and on social media. Sometimes it's ugly and sometimes, you know, at least it, it I kind of say at least it acknowledges who the original creator is. Um, and that's basically uh, that what you want. That brings up something I was um, that um, is recent. The Case Act. Are you familiar with the Case C A S E Case Act? This just passed a couple of months ago, and what it means is we can now, as creators, take this to small claims court. Previously, it was not a small claims issue. We had to have at least ten thousand dollars worth of damages before we could really do anything. Now we don't have to have that. I think it's three hundred. I, I don't remember. It's it's really low. Um, so the uh, small claims court can now hear our, the small business owners claims. So that's, that's from the case act. Look, look that up. If you're curious case C A S E the case act and it, again, it just passed. This is very recent. This is 2021. This just passed. All right. So moving to copyright registration and how to register, and then that'll be the end. Uh, copyright registration in general, Copyright registration is a legal formality intended to make a public record of the basic facts of a particular copyright. However, registration is not a condition of copyright protection. Even though registration is not, a requ is not required for protection, the copyright law provides several inducements or advantages to encourage copyright owners to make registration. Although these advantage, uh, among these advantages are Registration establishes a public record of the copyright claim. And before any infringement suit may be filed in court, registration is necessary for works of US origin. So what that is telling you, and that, that is their words, uh, what that's telling you is that if your copyright is infringed upon, even if you haven't registered it, go register it now. Yes, you should have done it beforehand. Yes, yes, yeah. Of course, but many of us don't ever register. We're not used to that. It's not part of our normal everyday operating procedure. Maybe it should be, but if you have it, register it now. Once you recognize the problem, register it and then move forward. What is the cost of registration? Ah, good question. Let's talk about that. Um, there's three different ways to register. And so I'm going to recommend that you register online because it's the quickest, easiest, cheapest, and you can track it. As far as how much, I'm trying to remember how much. Um, it is a lower filing fee when you register online than it is when you send a print in. 
I don't remember. I can tell you where to find that though. Uh, so uh, I yeah, have the URL. I can put that in. Yeah, we'll put uh, that right. in. Oh, here's a tutorial for it. This is this is exactly what you want. All right. Hang on a second while I copy that. Copy hyperlink. All right, I'm putting this. Uh, this is a uh, tutorial for registration. Okay, this should be in your chat if you're watching on Zoom. Uh, now that's a tutorial. It doesn't answer the question of how much, but this is knowing how to do it is is a is a good thing. And of course, once you're doing it, it'll tell you how much. Uh, now that's a tutorial to to register. You just go to copyright.gov. Copyright.gov, and you're going. Uh, to the Electronic Copyright Office. Electronic Copyright Office. By the way, they write it with a small e and then a capital C. Oh, you know how everything in, mil in, the, in the government is, is an acronym. Uh, it's a small e and then a large, uh, an uppercase C and O. ECL, the co Electronic Copyright Office. When you register, you, you registered first um, by not, re you register you and then you register the work. But once you have registered you or your company, then you don't have to do that part again. You're just registering work, but you register your, yourself first. Uh, and they're going to get your credit card and because they're going to charge you for each time you do this and they want to make that easy for themselves. Of course, you would too. Uh, so advantages of filing online, lower filing fee, fastest processing time, online tracking, secure payment by credit card, uh, and other they have other forms of payment as well, and ability to upload certain categories of deposits directly into the ECO as electronic files. So you can do it in other ways, but do it online. It's just so much easier to do this online. You can do it in, in batches or you can do it in individual certain advantages to doing it in batches, but you may have to do it as an individual at some point. You can zip your files too, if you're familiar with zipping files. So you zip all your files into one file, you upload the one file. So it could be easier that way for you. Up to 500 megabytes, they, they do have a limit. And you're getting some thank yous there on uh, YouTube. We did make the link available in the, the discussion chat there on, the, on YouTube as well. Cool. And I suppose I could put, um, let me, I said this before, it's copyright.gov, but I'll put that in the, um, in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. And if you prefer to call, I'll put the, the, I have the phone number here too for the mm -hmm. copyright office. So I'll put both the, the, uh, the URL, copyright.gov, and their phone number if you prefer to call. Great. And I know we're a copyright always has a million questions, and we can probably sit here like all day and still ask a million questions <laughs> because the law just has a, a way of kind of keeping us a little um, in the dark. Um, is there anything else, Jim, that you want to relay? we got about five minutes here, and I know you do have to run. I'm going to just put some more um, URLs that, that are beneficial to finding out more information about this subject. So this is the, what I mentioned before, wipo.int. Okay. Uh, that's the, the, uh, that one I mentioned before, but uh, these other ones I haven't. And if you're curious about the burn convention, let me give you some information about that. There's two URLs that I recommend to find out more about the burn. That's the international version in case you're curious, the Berne Convention, and it's a much older, uh, much older origin. So that's the Berne Convention information. 
Let's see. Um, I'll grab these from you right now. I mentioned ppa.com a little while ago, uh, copylaw.com, copyright.com, plagiarism checker, 10i.com. Let me put all of those real quick into in here. I'm glad Mike read that this was able to be a lot of information for you. Good to hear that. Um, Cynthia had a question about how do you choose, Jim, um, what you decide to register? Mm -hmm. uh, some would say every single thing you create, but come on. <laughs> Not every single thing you create. So you don't find a whole lot of value for everything you create yourself. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's amazing. You're like, oh, I love how this came out. Uh, and other times you're like, <laughs> delete uh, or throw it away or whatever. Um, so we have different reactions. So I would say those, um, so for photographers, every image that has the potential to be sold, maybe you should be considering um, uh, putting this uh, uh, to uh, getting a copyright registration. As far as uh, those whose uh, media medium is is painting, every single work that you create, photograph it and send it in. Yep, and you can sell, you can photograph your cell phone. Is it gonna be amazing? No, of course not. It might be, it's good enough though. The, the US Copyright Office does not need high quality. They need something to base your claim off of. So even if it's low quality, it still qualifies. So uh, those who, those who uh, paint is their medium or, or pencil is their medium, um, you do not need to hire for, for copyright registration purposes. There's no reason to hire someone who specializes in photographing artwork. Not for that purpose. For other purposes, if you're trying to sell it, there is some good advantages to hiring people who really know how to do that kind of thing. Um, but for not, not for copyright purposes. Copyright, just sell, photograph your cell phone and, and move on. Don't spend any more time thinking about making it pretty because it does not need to be pretty. Great. Um, well, Jim, I know we have a few minutes left. Did you want to talk about uh, what you're going to talk about next month, which is the low light photography? Thanks for reminding me. I was going to have to ask you. <laughs> uh, low light, man. This was a surprise to me when I wrote this class, it was really popular. And I was thinking, low light, people don't think about photography that way. But yeah, they do because there's so many instances where you find yourself in an area where it's just not enough light to photograph, doesn't look good. You're having to raise your ISO to such high amounts that the photograph comes at all ucky, grainy, yucky. Oh. There are lots of different ways to allow yourself to get more light. And we're gonna talk about those ways because you can get more light through your shutter speed, through your f-stop, yeah, through your ISO too, but there's, there's a downside to it. We're gonna talk about those, but we're gonna also talk about lenses and how we can use a, a lens to maximize the amount of light. Um, but the, and the lower number that f-stop, the more light you're able to come in. So there's some variables that we should think of, and I, I just call them all tools. There are some tools to help you in lower lighting situations. We're gonna talk about those next time on the Photo Tips Monthly Show. Great. And if you have any questions that we didn't get to, because I said uh, copyright is a downward spiral of questions, go ahead and leave them in the uh, chat. We'll get this over uh, to Jim. That's funny, Ruben. <laughs> so, uh, that, that's we'll, funny. Thanks, Ruben. <laughs> we'll try to get all those. James, any closing comments? Uh, no, I'm, other than that, I'm being kicked out of my office. Um, so I am going to have to tell everyone bye. <laughs> all right. And, uh, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you close it off from here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Jim, again, we appreciate uh, your time, especially knowing that you had to, to run to another event right now. And I'll get those links onto our uh, YouTube. But uh, you being the host, I'll let you end the meeting. And again, thank you very much. Good luck sure. with your thank, thank you, <laughs> Melissa. Uh, always fun talking to you guys. Uh, good questions, good energy. Uh, and, and I love talking about this stuff anyway, but it sure helps when I'm working with people who are interested in the subject and are asking questions and, and uh, interacting with what's going on. So thank you guys. I know you are taking time from something else. There are lots of things going on in your life. You chose to sacrifice whatever else that was to be here. 
And so I thank you for myself at Landers Photography School and uh, on behalf of Melissa and James at finerworks.com. Thank you for choosing us to help uplift what it is that you do. You guys rock. Bye. See you next time.